Hello, hello. Welcome to the shit show. We it's waited. Not a shit show. <laughs> no, ours is not. Oh. I'm talking about Super Tuesday. I'm talking about our like the, fucking the, democracy. The inflection. <laughs> the shit show, the, the, not the shit show. Oh, it's a killer show about a shit show. Thank you. Uh, th- th- we waited intentionally until Wednesday because we knew that whatever the fuck happened on Tuesday was going to infuriate us so much that uh, we would need to scream into a microphone for a bit. And sure enough, we were not let down on that front. There were uh, many shenanig- shit nanigans to go around. <laughs> um, this is, by the way the show where we talk censored stories and people, sensible solutions, and common ground movements to fight and build. And sometimes other shit like this shit. No, this is a censored story. It fits in the first category, all right? This is not the other stuff. (laughs) This is no other stuff. This is straight up stuff. (laughs) Uh, And uh, I'm joined, as always, by Eleanor Goldfield. Hi. And I'm Lee Camp. And uh, a quick preview on some of the stuff we're going to get into before we get started, Um, because I want you to know what's coming up. Uh, We're going to go through the delegate count, where it stands now. We're going to go through uh, what went down, you know, why it is Bernie Sanders seems to have lost all of these states when it seemed that he was going to win all of these states. Uh, We're going to go through kind of a, a myriad ways that these things are uh, rigged or at least slanted, uh, you know, a variety of kinds of tricks to make sure these results go for corporate America, for the corporate establishment of the DNC, and how exactly it works. We're going to go through some detailed numbers. Um, we're going to also go through some anecdotal evidence of what went down in California and Texas and a lot of other places. Um, we've got tons of info for you uh, that we're about to jump into. Before we get to that, I just wanted to say real quick that uh, this show only exists because of you guys. Like, you keep it going. And if you can go to patreon.com slash common censored and join up, become a member, you could even do like one dollar. Um, that is honestly why we're doing this show still after 98 episodes. Um, also I'm coming to perform live in, uh, let's see, let's see. I already did Texas. That was great, by the way. Thank you everybody in Texas for awesome shows. Um, I'm coming to perform live in New York city. That's this weekend. That's my book release event at strand books, uh, free. If you get the book also, I'll be in Flagstaff and Tucson. And now seems that Eleanor will be performing there as well. I will be. Yes. Awesome. Uh, Montreal, Columbus, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Toronto, all these places. It's at redactedtour.com, T-O-U-R, redactedtour.com. And uh, there's other cities as well that I'm not listing, Asheville, North Carolina. But also, Eleanor will be performing with Emily Yates in Denver, Colorado. Yes, on March 19th, the 17th anniversary of the most recent war on Iraq. Uh, So all of the information for that and the shows that I'm going to be with Lee at is available at artkillingapathy.com and just click on the performance tab. So last thing before we get knee deep in shit, my book is now shipping, not shitting, but shipping. Whee! Uh, LeeCampBook.com. You can grab a copy straight from the uh, publisher so you don't have to go through Amazon or anything. And uh, also ask your independent stores to carry it because I don't think Barnes & Noble is going to be grabbing that one anytime <laughs> soon. And by the way, there is a chapter or two on uh, election rigging, election fraud, and how it works. But anyway, let's get into what the fuck happened last night. Mm. And should I just start? I guess I should start with where we we say, where they say, where the establishment is telling us the delegate count um, stands right now. So they're not announcing, several outlets have projected Bernie Sanders the winner of California, but they're not announcing that final count, so you can't actually surmise a delegate count from California. But I will give you a delegate count from California if the percentages are to hold as they currently are. So if they were to hold, Uh, we'll also get into why California takes so long to count their uh, votes in a minute. But uh, so I went through and did the math. And by the way, can I just point out, and this is important, they're hardly giving these numbers. Mm -hmm. They're hardly giving them state by state number. Like uh, all the articles I was reading, I was like, well, what the fuck is the delegate count? 
what did how many more delegates did Bernie get? You know, did Bernie, did Joe Biden get in Texas than Bernie Sanders? Like, I and and very few places were giving these numbers. And so I actually went through and did the math just going by the you could you just take the uh, percentage that they won the vote by and do that times the delegate. Percentage. Well, and to, 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 to mention the, the first the, the first fuckery here is that they don't want you to look at the numbers. Right. Because if uh, if if you woke up today, Wednesday, March 4th, and you're looking at the headlines, all of the headlines just say, oh, my God. Biden is a fucking sorcerer. He managed to win all these states. Right. Oh my God, he's amazing. Right. Uh, and there's no mention of Sanders. There's certainly no mention of numbers. So this is shit that you have to dig for well, on there purpose. Is a me- there, there, is, there is a mention of Sanders in that, oh man, Sanders didn't do as well as we thought. Right. Um, so there's three numbers. So I'll give you the final ones first. So the total for Super Tuesday was Joe Biden got 540 delegates and Bernie Sanders got 470. Remember, those numbers will change uh, a little bit. Uh, I'm rounding 0.5s up to 1s, and I'm uh, also t- pretending that California is going to hold where it is uh, in terms of percentage of the vote. So if that happens, Joe Biden 540, Bernie 470. Now total, once you add that to the earlier voting, it's Joe Biden 594, Bernie Sanders 530. So still very close, which is really what most of these headlines should say is this race is very close. Um, a couple of key races that I think are the important ones is Virginia, where Joe Biden just racked up this crazy win uh, where he got 66 delegates. Bernie only got 29. So it's like 36 delegates more for Joe Biden, which if California numbers hold, will be almost the entirety of of the percentage Biden Bernie won by in California, meaning in a smaller state like Virginia, Joe Biden somehow ba- basically gobbled up the lead that Bernie would have gotten uh, from California. Uh, another one that uh, we'll be talking more about is Texas. Joe Biden, 88 delegates and Bernie Sanders, 79. That's going off of percentage of vote. Uh, and so that's, you know, still only... That's only nine delegates that that Joe Biden won Texas by. But again, the media ran around saying Bernie Sanders is going to win all the states. He might win every single state. Um, they and that's part of the game. That's part of the rigging is to give, make the expectations for Bernie Sanders to such a degree that if Bernie Sanders had just lost one of these states, you know, just lost Virginia, they would have said, whoa, big win for Biden. But because they, they created these crazy expectations that in a largely rigged system is like impossible to meet. OK, so those are the delegate counts. Uh, now let's get into some of the uh, shitstorm. Right. So <clears throat> uh, one of the th- I was just looking here at Virginia because Virginia's Virginia was called for Biden basically as soon as the polls closed with less than 1% reporting they had already called it for Biden which they're going off of exit polls and we're going to get more into those in yeah. a minute which yeah. they're not revealing to us for the most part go ahead right um but there it's also interesting because basically the way that not only are exit polls secret uh but basically the way that these primaries run is secret and yes you can find out who who uses for instance paper ballots and things like that but when it comes to the actual uh the actual technology behind it it's very very secretive on purpose and when when people do get a hold of this equipment and you know find out how it works they've had like 11 year olds hack it within oh my a matter God, they of like did. 10 minutes or something I, I had actually forgotten about that at one of these uh, uh conventions where they had a hacker convention i forget what it's mm-hmm. called they had had one hackathon, of the I think. hackathon where they had one of the uh, the old machines that are still used in a lot of states, and they asked the hackers to try and hack it, and they got in in like ten minutes. With here's the key though, with access to the machine, so you could go up to the machine and hack it very easily and change the vote count to whatever you wanted. Now that's not a Russian agent; that's someone <laughs> in person at the machine. Now, yeah, they're not hooked up to Wi-Fi. They're very, they're very rarely, there are some very bad systems out there that uh, at some point do hook to Wi-Fi, which many uh, security experts have said is a fucking disaster. But for the most part, these things are not and not supposed to be connected to Wi-Fi. So another, so I'm also looking at, uh, at 
at information about Virginia who updated. This is the other thing. The the states states will often say, oh, we've updated our voting systems. This is something that happened in, in L.A. County, for instance. They, quote unquote, updated their voting system uh, in like completely restructured it in, in a way that hasn't been restructured for the past half century. So updated this is when? Uh, just like, just, just, just before right. just before the the primary. So this is another way to do it, right? Because they're they, they claim, for instance, the Virginia Board of Elections claimed, quote, in order to ensure equipment security during the 2020 presidential election, the department has worked with the election vendor community, aka people who make fucking black boxes, uh, to develop an implementation plan to upgrade localities to standardized versions of equipment. All of that bullshit basically just means that we're going to institute a new voting system that allows us perhaps greater control or allows uh, more secrecy, less transparency. Right. And like you said, black boxes is a term that a lot of in election integrity uh, experts use to discuss these things because you can't get the code for most of these machines. You, they, It's so-called corporate proprietary code. So it's like a black box. I mean, imagine if it wasn't a computer and you just slipped your paper ballot into a literal black box and and then someone on the other side of the black box says, oh, yeah, OK, I, I can tell you what the final vote count is. And you say, well, what happened in that black box? And they, OK, I can't tell you that. Like, it's incredibly fucked. So the, the other thing is that uh, Virginia also, by the way, used to have a June primary that was now moved up to Super Tuesday. <laughs> to, to help the establishment candidates. The other thing that was done is that caucuses, they heavily cut, since 2016, cut the number of caucus states because caucuses were good for progressives. Like Obama won over Hillary, Bernie Sanders won over Hillary in caucuses. So it... And I know Obama's not a real progressive, but he made people think he was. <laughs> uh, so it, it was good for the farther left candidate at, at caucuses. And so they got rid of half of them. Right. So there there are, were actually a bunch of changes. I'm, I'm looking at a, an article from January 2020 uh, in WTOP News from Virginia that talks about a lot of uh, voting changes. Some have been implemented, some haven't. You know, for instance, they were talking about making primary day a holiday. That didn't happen. Um, <clears throat> but so a lot of this is something to look out for. A lot of states are implementing these quote these changes to quote unquote make it easier to vote or you know to to uh, to update or upgrade you're going to see that a lot and whenever you see that think bullshit because nobody nobody is updating or upgrading or whatever the fuck changing their 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 voting process to make it easier for us the voters that's not something that's happening I feel like it's like the uh, old silicon breast implants where people are like, I got an upgrade, and then they got cancer. <laughs> an int- a fascinating, you know what? Yeah. Um, <laughs> fascinating analogy there. Uh, another thing that you're going to you're going to read about, and this is actually from September 2019 in the in the Houston Chronicle that that uh, that reports that Texas has closed more polling places than any other state. Well, and there were even more closures after it seemed that Bernie Sanders was going to just run away with the Texas vote, but especially the Latino vote in Texas, which is huge. And The Guardian was reporting that uh, like, once that became clear, they closed hundreds of polling places in heavily Latino areas. Mm-hmm. So... Well, and and it, it's easy for someone who doesn't like follow these issues to be like, all right, well, you just got to go to another closing, you go to another polling place. But they're going off of percentages here. And a certain percentage of people, when the polling place is hard to find, give up. A certain percentage of people will not wait in line for three hours to cast their vote. And Bernie Sanders benefits from a large turnout, a lot of new voters coming in and deciding to vote. And if you stop people from voting, it's better for the establishment candidate. Right. And of course, you know, that there's there's so much privilege even just saying, well, just go to a different polling place. Right. Like if there was a polling place down the street from you and you could walk there, you know, with your kid or something. But now there's an hour drive. You'd have to find childcare or something like that. Like and you don't have a car. You'd have to take like four buses and a fucking donkey to get there like. It is not easy for people. Uh, and this is, of course, the point. And, of course, again, the way that this was uh, presented to people was, oh, well, we want to shift to centralized voting centers. 
So, it, well, in California, that's how it was presented. Well, no, in Texas, I'm, oh, in I'm Texas reading about too? Texas, oh, okay. uh, and I guess also California. But they, you know, the way that they present it is, oh, well, we want to centralize the voting centers to make it easier and more convenient, which is the exact fucking opposite of what that does. Well, and you know, especially if you cut the number. So even if it were more convenient, if you've got, uh, you know, w- uh, one polling place for uh, 100,000 people and you used to have five for 100,000 people, now you've got people waiting in line for hours. And in California, and, and I'm sure many of you listening dealt with this, uh, there were, especially in Los Angeles, there were like lines that were like hours long. It was ridiculous. And in a minute, I'm going to read an email from someone else from California and the, the shit they had to go through. So, and the other, th- the other thing to keep in mind here is that, is how, how delegates are, uh, awarded and, uh, Vox has a, has a breakdown of how, uh, how delegates are, of uh, what's the word, uh, awarded to different candidates. Um, and it's fucking bananas. And I, I talked about this after, I believe it was the Iowa caucus, uh, basically there, yeah, it was the Iowa caucus where I read a tweet of somebody who worked at a caucus, uh, like polling place and he had written out the math and it was some horrendous bullshit where there was multiplication and <laughs> division. And I'm like, as soon as you're bringing in multiplication and division, what the fuck? It should be this person won, won this much and then they get the del. Like it shouldn't be that fucking difficult. Uh, but of course that's another thing is to make it this awkward and difficult math, kind of like, you know, what you see in, in schools these days, the common core math where you have to take 50 fucking steps to find out what four plus four is. (laughs) So, so yeah, talk about what happens to delegates from suspended campaigns. So, so Buddha judge, as many of you know, Buddha judge and Amy Klobuchar, two very establishment, very corporate candidates dropped out the night before, basically like a super Tuesday surprise the night before they dropped out and endorsed or one to one day before and endorsed Joe Biden so that all of the media, I mean, they basically were not even mentioning Bernie Sanders. All of the media for an entire, I'd say over 24 hours was nothing but look at all the endorsements Joe Biden is getting. So before I get to that, I just want to read this one sentence to give folks, and I'm not going to go through the whole math because it's going to make you fall asleep and my brain's going to explode. I'm, I'm asleep already. I just want to read this one sentence. And this is again from the Vox breakdown. Um, which was by the up. way, folks, Vox garbage news site. But occasionally, right. you if you're looking for something like a definition of where delegates go, then right, no, don't go there <laughs> for actual like commentary on our <laughs> fucked up capitalist <laughs> empire. But when it comes to like the legit, the, the un- illegitimate way that the Democrats allot delegates, they have this math right. Um, so, <laughs> so this sentence: uh, first of all, you have to meet the fifteen percent threshold. Next, we calculate how much of the remaining vote each candidate who met the threshold got. The resulting percentage, up to three decimal places, will be the key number for allocating delegates. Yeah, so that's something else that I, I mean, it's kind of crazy. That's something else I should mention is I, in the, in the numbers I gave you earlier, I did not, uh, I, I was not looking at like how many, I was not looking at like the candidates that got under 15% or whatever. So it is like, like I said, those numbers are not exact. Um, there, so there will be some delegate changes depending on like whether Elizabeth Warren got 12% and then she didn't meet the threshold. So then more delegates go to one of these people. It was just some quick initial math on the vote percentages per like uh, in terms of delegates. But anyway. Right. So I just wanted to share that because even even if there wasn't fuckery in the polling places, which there obviously is, the way that these delegates are are awarded is completely fucked. So I want Lee, you mentioned the uh, the how the how the delegates are awarded uh, or what happens to delegates with people who have dropped out. Now, the problem here is one of semantics. So technically, Buttigieg and Klobuchar have not dropped out. They have suspended their compa- campaigns, which means that their campaigns are like zombies. They're basically <laughs> they're not like right. trying to win anything anymore, but their campaigns are still going, right. which means that for instance, Buttigieg now can still hold on to his three delegates from New Hampshire. And basically the way that this or works Or Iowa, which he had a lot. The 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 way that this works is 
uh, you you win delegates in each state by that completely fucked math that I kind of hinted at. Because God forbid we should go by popular vote. <laughs> and then going into the convention in July, what happens is that there there's a first round vote where all of these delegates that have been pledged through the primaries and caucuses vote for the candidate that they've been pledged to. And that basically goes without a hitch because for the most part, those delegates that have been awarded are, uh, are, are sticking to that candidate with regards to Buttigieg and Klobuchar. They can tell them their delegates, Hey, at the first round, go ahead and vote for Biden. They can do that, but usually it doesn't happen that way. What will happen then is there's a second round vote. Where the super delegates assuming step in. no one got fifty percent, which it's almost definite is not going to happen, which is nineteen ninety one thousand nine hundred ninety delegates, uh, and of course the 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 point of of having this race structured the way it is with four billion fucking people running for Democrat is that someone like Sanders, uh, plus all the fuckery on the ground, won't come in with what's called a plurality, which is. The majority of the delegates, which is 1990. What happens then is that the superdelegates are called on for a second round vote. Now, superdelegates are the party elite, the higher ups at the DNC who fucking hate Sanders. And there was a recent They've article. Said, yeah. yeah, there was a recent article uh, that where they bas- they asked the superdelegates and the superdelegates basically admitted they're like, we're not voting for Sanders. Yeah, it was like it was like 80 some out of 91. Uh, uh, sorry. 80 some percentage of the superdelegates were going to vote for uh, for Biden, um, which is why. And so so all of these things after Super Tuesday, this is part of why the the 538 forecast of what is likely to happen before the convention uh, initially had, you know, a couple weeks ago had Sanders at 50 percent chance of getting the majority needed to have to lock up the nomination by the convention. Now Sanders is down to a one in 12, 8% chance of getting the uh, 50% needed heading into the convention. Biden is at three in 10, 31% chance and no one meaning neither of them (laughs) is at three in five chance, 61% uh, chance that going into the convention, it will be no one, which is going into the convention. It's no one. That means going into the convention. It's Biden because all these super delegates will, uh, will combine to uh, force Biden into the nomination. Um, all right, let's uh, let, let's keep going, shall we? Uh, well, let's talk about some of the things that. So there were these long lines, which we meant, which we mentioned. We should go through some of the. Oh, sorry. No, so I, I was just going to point out Politico actually has a has a map up where it talks about uh, how how people are voting on Super Tuesday, meaning like what what kind of. Uh, um, electronics or what have you. So if you hover over the map, you can see it. For instance, Texas, uh, predominantly their counties still use insecure electronic voting machines without any paper trail. Uh, and as we noted, the so many polling places have closed in predominantly poor black and brown neighborhoods, which would typically go for a candidate like Sanders. Sanders was doing phenomenally uh you know before super tuesday polls showed that sanders was doing fucking wonderfully in texas so again if you look at the reality of the situation with how it actually uh shook out and on on tuesday it seems absurd that someone like biden would have actually won and it is absurd and there's obviously a lot of fuckery at play well yeah so we're in a minute we're going to get into some of the conspiracy theories although i think several of them are not even theories they're just conspiracies as to why this is ending up this way uh you something to keep in mind of how ridiculous this is is that joe biden had before South Carolina had almost zero money left in his coffers, had like zero ads playing in a lot of these states, and didn't even show up to a lot of these Super Tuesday states. Mm-hmm. He wasn't doing rallies in a lot of these states. His entire hopes were on South Carolina springboarding him into this establishment candidate uh, that that they viewed as the only chance to beat Sanders. And uh, so... But but even that didn't really happen in the sense that, yes, he won South Carolina. He did fine there and uh, and won South Carolina. But he still was not in any of these states. He had zero ground game in some of these states. So the idea that he's upsetting Bernie Sanders in states where he's got no ground game, no get out the vote, zero money is just like hysterical. And anyway, we're going to get into more of that in a second. We're going to why why that may have happened 
in, in a second. But uh, do we? Let's do some anecdotal uh, California stuff. Yeah. So basically, uh, first of all, L.A. County, which is where most of the the fuckery has been reported from, uh, w- they they unveiled for Super Tuesday their first fully redesigned election system in more than half a century. So again, because you know that's always a good thing, right? The day before right. to be like, oh, let's try out something completely new, right? Uh, so so rather I, than you know spending the last four years prepping that, right? Exactly. Um, so one of the things that I saw was, uh, this was a hilarious tweet that I shared. Um, this guy, RC Rex 74 wrote on a scale of one to invade Russia in the winter. How great is this new <laughs> voting a, center uh, idea uh, what said. on a scale of one to invade Russia in the winter? <laughs> Uh, the first, the first one had a line 40 cars deep that couldn't even get into the parking lot. The estimated wait time here is November, 2024. <laughs> And well, this is another thing in L.A. County. They said you could vote anywhere. So folks know that usually like you have your 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 designated polling place. What L.A. County said, uh, you know, in, in, in their 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 uh, their fight to be more altruistic and accessible, said you could vote anywhere. But what happens there if you've ever been to L.A. and you know how shit is is structured if you vote wherever you happen to be, no one's going to happen to be at the polling place in fucking like Beverly Hills, right? They're going to be like heavily in like, like heavily populated areas where a lot of people work, where a lot of people might be driving through on their way to work or whatever. This shit is, is structured to make sure that the longer lines are where a lot of folks live, which means they're not spread out like somewhere like Beverly Hills, but they're, uh, where where people have a lot of uh, what's the word? There's a lot of uh, concentrated population, and of course, you know, places where uh, where, where folks might be uh, concentrated in terms of work. So it was a fucking mess. And the other thing that's interesting is I heard this from a friend of mine, Sam, in uh, in L.A. Um, she said that uh, she said that she went to vote. And first of all, she was like, she was like, I'm pretty sure Tesla made these fucking voting machines. They're very sleek. But, you know, the question is, like, what's going on behind this sleek facade? She also pointed out that it is an electronic ballot that has the names of every single fucking candidate, ones that dropped out, you know, a hell of a long time ago, like Cory Booker, Andrew Yang. Um, right, it's like this eternal list of candidates. Julian Castro, Marianne which, Williamson. <laughs> which, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably could easily look down that list and know uh, you know, which one you support and which ones maybe even have dropped out and things like that. But your average, a lot of average people who go to vote on that day like look down a list like that, they get uh, fucking confused and they're like, who is the one who said with the health care? who said he'd give us health care, right. and it gets very confusing. And sometimes Bernie Sanders is, like, on the next page or something. Like, Yeah, exactly. Well, and you brought up, what was that? That, that uh, mail-in, someone, said, someone posted a photo of the mail-in ballot, which they got, and the list was so long that there were only two candidates on the back of the page, and one was Bernie Sanders. So uh, I'm sure a lot of people looked down this list of candidates and thought, oh, Bernie Sanders isn't on it. Right. Um, oh, and another thing that people in L.A. Uh, mentioned was that uh, there's th- there was an election shortcut that you could use with the new system. Ballot selections could be filled out on a smartphone ahead of time and transferred to the touchscreen machines with a QR code. Uh, <laughs> which, that sounds super secure. And there's no paper trail here, right? So, uh, now, I want people to understand, this is not an accident. This is not... Oh my goodness, we weren't really prepped for this. Now, whether the whether the new program that is wor- you know, they tried out is working great, that could be an accident, who knows? But a lot of this, such as the no party preference voters, which I talked a lot about in Redacted tonight, um, I wrote a truth dig column about it. Many people who were independents, meaning no party preference, uh, went into their polling places and they're kind of tricked into giving being given the wrong ballot. Um, and that type of stuff is by design. Like we, we've had many people post online that they were in an election, uh, uh, what do you call a, a, a polling place, a worker, a volunteer, and they were being told, you know, give them the, give them this ballot and don't give them the other one unless they literally say the phrase democratic crossover ballot. Like, and if they say I want a democratic ballot, 
basically they don't they don't train them they don't say these words but basically give them the wrong one give them the democratic ballot without the presidential candidates on it and see if they care enough to argue with you basically and so a lot of this is by design i want people to understand that the democratic establishment wanted and 2016 as well wants people to get confused wants people to go home especially npp voters especially independent voters california is a massive state with millions of people voting and if all of the npp voters are held up confused have to wait longer have to deal with things have to argue to get their ballot it just heavily decreases the npp vote they're then often given a provisional ballot if they're told they're not on the rolls or whatever and those provisional ballots Many are counted, many are not, but whether they are counted or not, they, they're counted days later when the media have already given the story of what happened in California. And I want to talk more about that in a second, but I want to read this uh, email from this guy who this specifically uh, what happened to him in California. So he didn't give his name, so I'm sorry I can't thank you, but uh, he emailed and he said exactly what Lee said would happen on Redacted Tonight happened to me. Uh, I'm in California. I walked into the polling place. I was next to a guy who was no party preference, just like I am, and he was told he wasn't in the system. He said he'd been voting at the same polling place for decades. I'm also MPP, so surprise, they claim that I was not in the system either. Uh, keep in mind, NPP means independent, which is almost no always party preference. yeah, which is almost always uh, voting for Bernie Sanders because more independents go towards Sanders than towards Biden. So, claimed I wasn't in the system either, even though I've uh, never amended my reservation, been voting here for years, um, for over a decade. Finally, they were able to confirm my registration by contacting the county registrar. Then a clerk read out my options. So. Keep in mind how long that takes. you got to call someone up, talk to them about this. This creates lines, which make it so a lot of people have to go home. They were on their way to work. They were going to vote in 10 mm-hmm. minutes. Now they've got to wait an hour. They can't. they got to go to work. That kind of thing is useful to the Democratic Party establishment because it means Bernie voters go home. Um, I'll continue the email. The clerk read out my options as an MPB voter. Democratic ballot, Democratic crossover. I politely requested a a Democratic crossover ballot. I asked if this was indeed a Democratic crossover and was assured that it was. I began filling out my ballot, and I was about halfway through when I looked at the top of the header and it said Democratic Party. I immediately went to the clerks and said I was mistakenly given a Democratic Party ballot rather than an MPP uh, Democratic crossover ballot. Uh, by the way, just to stop real quick, there's two ways this can fuck people uh, out of their vote. One is that the Democratic Party ballot given to an NPP voter, does not have the presidential candidates on it. That's one. Another way is if you're given the wrong ballot and then it's put in the wrong envelope, so you get a Democratic ballot, they then put it in an NPP envelope, that can then be thrown out because the envelope doesn't match with the ballot. Okay, continuing. I went up and said this is a Democratic Party ballot, not a crossover ballot. I was then told by the clerk, you're wrong, young man. (laughs) I calmly retorted, no, I'm not. I requested a Democratic crossover ballot. I'm NPP. There was a contentious discussion between a few of the clerks, with one telling the other, you're giving out the wrong ballots again. This was about 3 p.m., he says. After a while, I saw and pointed out the crossover ballots under the table for NPPs, and they refused to give me. So he just happened to see the pile of correct ballots sitting there, and they refused to give him the crossover ballot. I stood there for five literal goddamn minutes waiting to be given the correct ballot. It felt as if they were trying to confuse and intimidate me, which they were. And I know I'm not the only NPP voter who went through this just in this one polling place alone. But you probably are, a, you know, a small handful that were able to... To, to get through to the end and actually get that crossover ballot right. because you had this information right. and you had the you were able to, to 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 interact with these folks to actually get the correct ballot and again you know you don't always have uh, I I, mean, I remember anecdotally uh, hearing about this in 2016 a friend of mine li- who lives in East LA which is a predominantly uh, Latino community basically said that there were several people who just didn't understand. Uh, you know what? I don't know what crossover means. What I don't know, yeah. like, because yeah. they're the, the fucking English is their second language, and I don't even know what the fuck crossover means, and it's my first language. <laughs> so this is like, and, and and people who who know can then go up and ask for it, but then if they're told no, I gave you the right ballot, they might think, well, 
I maybe guess she's right. I guess yeah. I mean she must know, right? She's she a poll worker right. because th- this is this is so it it requires you to have so much distrust in the system yep. walking in that you will fight so hard to get this ballot, but most people either don't know, feel insecure because they're 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 not totally sure of of the way things work, uh you know, don't have English as a first language, all of these things. And you know, same thing holds true with the provisional ballots. For instance, another uh, another thing that I saw yesterday was uh, another story from East L.A. People were just being handed provisional ballots as soon as they walked in, which, so again, is, Lee already mentioned what the provisional ballots mean. Polling and this places is a, are told to do this. This just, is a heavily Latinx uh, community, and they're handed a provisional ballot. Th- I mean— most people fucking who are like grew up here and uh, and and speak English and as their first language don't know what that means. Don't know what the fuck that means. And they think it's like a regular ballot, and so they fill it out and they give it in and they go home and they think I voted. Now, as Greg Palast, who's done tons of election work, calls them, they're placebo ballots. Right. Now, some of them are counted, so I don't want to say that none of them are counted, but. Uh, enough are thrown out, and they're th- and they're count and the ones that are counted are counted late enough that really what it's designed to do is basically fake people into thinking they voted. Go home, you did your civic duty, you did what you wanted to do. Give us that pe- piece of paper that will, uh, you know, likely be thrown out, or uh, you know, like I'm saying, like let's let's assume California is actually counted. All the provisionals are counted uh, a week from now, two weeks from now. By then, it is settled Doesn't in matter. America's mind right. what happened in California, what percentage was won, and it, it just makes sure that the, that the true, like, bump and, uh, su- and, and the true support that is being given to Bernie Sanders in California isn't really known, isn't really talked about. The media can say, oh, we don't really know what's going to happen in California. Uh, some outlets still have not uh, d- declared Bernie Sanders the winner in California. So it really is designed to slow his momentum. And Something people need to realize is that despite Joe Biden winning all those states last night, uh, if Bernie Sanders had won by enough in California, he would have still swamped everything that Biden won in those other states because California is so massive. Like if Bernie Sanders had just won California and Texas by a large enough percentage, he would have still destroyed all the delegates that Biden got. So they needed to keep California within enough margin that uh, uh, Bernie Sanders could, you know, uh, uh, that Bernie Sanders couldn't um, defeat what Biden was winning in other states. And so they did that by, you know, making it very difficult for people to vote and purging so many of them from the rolls. Um, we haven't even gotten to all the purging. Like they, they sent out postcards to a bunch of people. Uh, you know, I'm talking hundreds of thousands saying like, uh, if you return this correctly, then we'll send you your ballot. And many students who are a big Bernie Sanders supporting group, um, they move every year. So they don't get those uh, postcards. And in fact, apparently of the students it was sent to, 5% returned the postcard to actually get their ballot. So another thing going on with uh, with L.A. County in particular is that uh, some 3,500 neighborhood voting locations closed. And again, this is the same thing that I was talking about with uh, with with what they said about Texas. Oh, we want to centralize it, make it easier. And then, of course, with the oh, you can vote anywhere, um, which is fucking stupid. Another like and and so the issue with that too is that one person mentioned that they had been waiting in line at a polling place close to USC and that's in a predominantly black neighborhood. It's in uh, it, it's like a little bit south of downtown Los Angeles. And they basically said uh, when they got to the front after waiting in line for two hours, they were told, oh, there are shorter lines elsewhere. Well, that's some shit you tell people before they get to the front of the fucking line after they've been waiting for two hours. But of course, if you tell people that are, are that have been waiting or see the line and turn around and say, fuck it, I can't vote in this predominantly black neighborhood. Well, oops, I guess they don't vote. And meanwhile, somewhere else, there is a shorter line. Right. Uh, so this is again, this is just more, you know, more examples of that uh, of 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 that fuckery and 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 also it's not like they told people that these polling places were closing so one woman told the LA Times uh she went to her usual polling place and it was closed and that's it and then they just they just were able they were able to find uh another nearby polling place but it's like if you go to a polling place 
and you don't right. have like a smartphone to see where the other polling place is, uh, then I guess, oh, too bad for you. You go home. And if you don't know how to use QR codes or whatever the <laughs> fuck, or you're not familiar with an electronic system, then you're also shit out of luck. So can I get into the uh, yes. shift of exit polls? Now, something else which I've mentioned on a previous episode is that last time around in the 2016 the exit polls were largely being given out. We're being told to uh, the American populace. Our mainstream media would say our exit polls are showing that, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton's winning or Bernie Sanders is winning or whatever. That exit polling was largely being done by just one company. That company was then gutted even more. Several of the outlets that were using it have, uh, you know, left. Fox News said they were creating their own exit polling. Um, so exit polling has gotten even worse. But on top of that, the mainstream media realized that people were looking at these exit polls, comparing them to the machine results and saying, hey, there's something fucked up here. Why is it that it appears Bernie Sanders is winning by these exit polls, but then in the machine vote, Hillary Clinton suddenly pulls it out in a large degree? You know, why is there a 10 point shift between exit polls and machine vote counts? And they, 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 the establishment couldn't explain it. And so now this year round, they've this time around, they've, they've basically stopped giving giving out the exit polls of the actual votes. They'll give out exit polls of gender and exit polls of, okay, this many uh, people say that health care is important to them. And the reason they're doing that is because you can't use those to try and figure out what the vote should have been. Can you just explain real quick what an exit poll is? It just it just means you're walk you're leaving the building and they ask you uh, these questions like who did you vote for and what matters most to you and that kind of thing. Um, and... Exit polls can be done really well. Some people go, oh, well, they, uh, you know, were more heavily in cities, so that didn't take into account how well Biden does in the country area. No, exit polls are done really well now. They know how to calculate population size. They know how to calculate who they're talking to. Oh, we ended up talking to uh, three black people, and that overrepresents the black population, so we'll do, you know, they, they have a lot of math involved, and they can do it well. Like, the, the idea that exit polls are just, we don't know what the fuck's going on. We talked to that guy over there, and he said he voted for someone, and that's all we did. No, it's it's far more intricate than that, and they can do them well. And in a lot of countries, exit polls show fraud. Like, the country will literally say there was election fraud if the exit polls vary more than 2% from the uh, vote count coming out of the, the actual, you know, ballot counting. So... Here, we've stopped reporting them because they don't want people to know what's going on. But I want to tell you what happened last time around in 2016, which uh, spawned Exit Poll Gate, which then uh, had the establishment, you know, running around trying to say, no, 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 everything's legit. There's no problem with our voting system at all. Um, what happened was people pointed out how different the exit polls in many of these states were from the machine results. And uh, I have the list here of the, that the, of the some of the biggest spreads difference from exit poll versus machine results. Uh, most of them are not Super Tuesday states, but a few are. For example, Texas had almost a ten point swing. This is towards Hillary Clinton. So basically, exit polls. Everyone walking out of the building goes, "I voted for Bernie Sanders," and then the vote count comes out, and it says Hillary had a 10-point swing in her direction. Virginia was a 4.5 swing. North Carolina was only 1.8. So that's actually within the margin of error uh, that most people consider uh, acceptable to some degree. Um, so those are the big, those are the big uh, Super Tuesday ones that are on that list. But it's interesting that Virginia is on that list and Texas because – Texas is one area that Bernie Sanders was definitely looking like he was going to win, and Biden just magically pulled it out. Another is Virginia. Like, maybe Biden was uh, close to winning in the polling in Virginia, but all of a sudden he trounces Bernie Sanders to the point that Biden got as many extra delegates from Virginia almost that uh, Bernie Sanders got from California, like the difference between the two of them. So, uh, it you know— it, it, it's, it's not saying that's 
that's not proof of anything. Like you can't run around saying I have proven there is that the machines are rigging this thing, but it is something that people should be talking about. Right. And there should be a deeper analysis. There should be an audit of the machines. There should be a discussion of this. And instead, if you even talk about it, like I'm doing right now, you're called a, a crackpot and how dare Aluminum you. Aluminum hat wear. How dare you question our election system? Meanwhile, the mainstream will run around saying, well, Russia put up three Facebook ads, so that rigged our elections. Um, yeah, well, uh, so so the other the, the other thing here is that, and I don't know if you mentioned this, Lee, but that, that exit polls now, they're still used, but by these specific entities on their own, and you can't find them. Like, there's no, there, to there's nowhere to find, like, the entire... Uh, the, like exit poll and what CNN will do, for instance, well, they'll say, well, you know, our exit polls show that women, da 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 da, or that people who like healthcare, da 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 da, but they'll not say, like, in the entirety of our exit polls, right. this is what we found. Right. So they'll give you these little, th- these little breadcrumbs of exit polls. So, for instance, this one website um, th- that uh, th- that reports on this called TDMS Research, and I haven't really done any research into who they who they specifically are, but they were shared by an election integrity specialist uh, whose name I will find in a moment. But basically, what they've done is they've been able to find some of that exit poll information. Some of those breadcrumbs, as it were, and the name of this uh, election integrity specialist is uh, is Emily uh, we'll just Emily go with Levy. Emily, Emily Levy. <laughs> Sorry. So um, so she posted uh, a, this site TDMS Research, and basically they have uh, exit poll data from New Hampshire and South Carolina on their website. I don't think they've got anything up from Super Tuesday, at least not when I have looked at their website. Uh, and one of the examples, for instance, from New Hampshire shows that uh, Buttigieg, for instance, uh, based on exit poll data, should have received approximately 21.7 of the total vote. The computerized vote count, however, shows a 12% increase of votes from the exit poll projection. That's a huge fucking margin. Uh, I believe, Lee, you mentioned either, I I think before we started, that anything above 2% is considered fraudulent. This is 12%. That's it's, six times it's the cons- amount. It's considered enough that it, that the vote needs to be re, uh, recounted, reestablished. Like, it, so, it's enough for people to look into it, yeah. So that's 12% difference, a 12% gain in New Hampshire. So, But here's the interesting point, that because TDMS research is, is going off of, you know, what CNN said, they're going off of their gender category. So basically, that means that they don't have this. Isn't this this percentage uh, that they've found is not the entire exit poll data? It's just based on the gender category. Does that mean it's not valid? Of course not. It's still valid, but it's a portion of that information. What the full exit poll data would show? Who the fuck knows? It could be a lot more. It could be a little less. But either way, it shows fuckery and just the. Just the like the plain idea that they won't show us exit poll right, data. They right. will only show us what the computers fucking spit out when the computers, as we mentioned, can be hacked by fucking 11-year-olds. That is absolutely vehemently undemocratic, unjust, and totally fucking unacceptable. Right, and the fact that we're the only country with this full-on like black box system, and then they've now added further curtains in front of the black box. Like the fact right. that the exit polls were too much information, and so we need yeah. to block off people even more. Nothing to see here. Move along, folks. It's like that scene from Naked Gun where the entire fireworks factory is exploding behind him, and he just he's facing the other direction going, nothing to see here. <laughs> Keep moving, folks. And behind him, it's like... Uh, yeah, that's what is going on with our fucking system. Yep. Um, so to kind of sum this up, uh, can I do the sum up? Are we ready for the sum up? I think so. Okay. One point that uh, I find really fascinating is in order to justify these major shifts in what people thought was going to happen, you know, Bernie Sanders doing so well in the polling, um, 
and what actually happened in order to kind of justify those, in order to make people not so horrified, like, wait, what the fuck just happened? They have to have something big happen the night before each of these things. So some of these things, it was like a debate before South Carolina where they filled the audience with like Bloomberg and Biden supporters mm-hmm. and, and filled the audience with people booing Bernie Sanders. Because they're the only ones spoke. who could fucking afford a $3,000 ticket. Yeah, yeah, literally. <laughs> uh, and and so they did that. Um and so they kind of need something where people go, wow, I bet that'll shift the vote. Uh, and before Super Tuesday, what did they do? They There's pressure. And by the way, there, there's uh, many people are reporting that it was pressure from Obama himself calling up Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar and basically forcing them, you know, if you want to have a future in this party, uh, get behind Joe Biden. Um, so that was the big Super Tuesday surprise. And I think that it's not just to help Joe Biden, which is part of it, but it's to make people think that it makes sense that Joe Biden, a senile, uh, craptastic <laughs> candidate with the worst record since Hitler to, uh, to, <laughs> to, to, you know, run for president. It took him three decades to, to win, win his one first state. state, South Carolina, running for president three times. He can't keep his eyeball or his teeth in his face. He doesn't remember. Can't keep his hands to himself. Can't keep his hands to himself. He doesn't remember where he is. Um, and he, d- he does speech his face in the wrong direction. He confused, you said in his thank you speech, oh, he yeah, confused his, his daughter. Oh, yeah, his victory speech last night, he confused his wife and his sister, which is just a sister. lot of weird shit. A lot of weird shit, shit going on there. Uh, but this guy has a most horrific record. So they have to convince the American public that it makes sense that a guy like that with zero money in the bank for this campaign and with no ground game in a lot of states somehow trounced Bernie Sanders despite what the polling was showing. And in order to do that, something crazy has to happen. So Buttigieg and Klobuchar dropping out and endorsing Biden, it was the like crazy thing that they're using Suspended, to justify. Suspended, not dropped out. Suspended, yeah. <laughs> Suspended their their campaign, uh, so I think that's that's part one. Uh, and the rigging by the media is another thing, right? This is uh, endless coverage in the past few in the past week attacking Bernie Sanders, attacking everything he he stands for, but exaggerating what he stands for, right? Acting like he's fucking Fidel Castro or some shit, or that he like high fives dictators, even though America, the American establishment, supports seventy percent of all world dictators, not Bernie Sanders. So it, it, it's like. They, they've just been going after him endlessly on in every newspaper, everywhere you can imagine. Just it is a full on media, uh, just, I don't know, gang on pile, slot. pile on of, of trying to trash Bernie Sanders. So that's, you know, rigging by our media. That's rigging by our Absolutely. corporate entities to try and stop Bernie Sanders. Uh, then you get into the exit polls, getting rid of them. That's a form of rigging because it's a form of, uh, you know, covering up what's going on in our system. Then you have the suppression, right, which is uh, closed polling pa- places, purged voters, sending out postcards no one replies to, telling people they're not on the rolls. Here's a provisional ballot, uh, giving them the wrong ballot, ballot, as we discussed, with NPP voters. Uh, you know, in, in, in Texas, just making things confusing enough that your low information voter looks at the long list of candidates, doesn't know his fucking, you know, elbow from his asshole and like, well, it looks like a list of assholes. Uh, and it is. So <laughs> fractional yeah. voting. Oh, yeah. We didn't even get into fractional voting. So I'll just give the, the short version of that, which is inside the code of some of these computer systems, some of these computer voting systems, uh, election integrity experts have found that the vote counts are 1.0, which a vote count should never be 1.0 because that shows that there is a possibility for a 0.9 vote or a Mm -hmm. 1.1 vote, Mm -hmm. and that should not exist. So the fact that there's even code saying that 1.0 votes are being registered in the system is a like built-in way to defraud the system. Furthermore, in some of the states where you actually could show uh, how, like Hillary's vote count last time around, um, as it progressed during the day, the difference between Bernie Sanders and Hillary had a steady line chart right. going outward, which uh, experts, statistical experts, I don't want to claim I would understand the shit, but uh, statistical experts, some of them have come forward and said that that graph Doesn't- isn't... 
make the, sense. It doesn't make sense the way voting should work. Right. Like, there's no reason that two candidates should steadily go apart like that. That um, one should go down while the other goes up. One but- should go slightly down while the other goes up. The only thing that, like all day long, the only way that happens is if you have fractional voting where they were going to be kind of neck and neck, but instead uh, one side is amassing 1.1 votes and the other side is amassing 0.9 votes. Because the graph basically shows that it's relative to each other, that right. they're dependent upon each other, right. this grow and, and, and shrink, which doesn't make any fucking sense. Right. So we don't have the numbers of this time around at least for now maybe someone will get them but for now to prove that but that would be another uh, a way that this system is rigged and a, and you know the final way which if fractional voting is part of it is just the, the the fact that we don't have the code on these machines we don't know what the fuck's going on and so when you would think that the polling shows that oh Bernie Sanders is going to win Texas and suddenly Texas uh, you know B- Biden wins by fucking 20 points mm-hmm. you go well, well that's fucking crazy and it it it, it could be machines, but you we don't know, which right. is the and, way it's designed. And the other thing, besides not knowing the code, is unlike in other, in other countries where there's an audit regardless of whether there's any like fuckery at play. They just, at the end of the day, when they've closed the polling places, they do an audit to make sure that things make sense, that things match. But we don't do that. That only happens if it happens when somebody no. demands that it happens when there's like a lawsuit or something like that. Well, I need to correct you. They do do an audit of the machines, uh, but uh, some most states and some of them, they're supposed to be publicly visible uh, in California, for example. But they then do everything they can to try and cover up those things. In California, last time around, where people went to view the publicly viewable audit of the machines, they were harassed. They were harangued. They were told you can wait in the hallway. And they said, no, it's our right to view this audit in, Ca- in chicago they would stack up plastic bins of uh you know ballots to cover up the view of the public who came to see this audit and in C- chicago in front of the election board i played this video and if any of them are listening you guys are awesome there's election integrity these are just volunteers that went in and they saw people literally erasing the audit of the machine count in changing it to make sure it fit with what we were they were being told by you know the the initial numbers, which is the opposite of an audit. That's a, that's just defrauding the. System. I stand corrected. We do audits. We just don't do legit audits. <laughs> we don't do legit audits. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of states do have audits. Oh, and North, uh, New York was another one where they, uh, the public went to try and view the audit of the machines and was just like harassed and harangued and pushed out, which should be illegal. Um, anyway, if it's in one of your states, if you find out when that audit is and it's a public viewly viewable audit of the machines, fucking go there and demand your right to see those machines because that is the only way any of this shit comes out. That is the only way people know what is going on with our system. Yep. Uh, okay. So we have a few minutes left and we want to talk about how we're all going to die soon. No, that's not <laughs> how I want to talk about it. Uh, no, I'm I being w- sarcastic we because have fi- we're we, not. We have, we're five, not. we have five minutes left. Oh, by the way, I, since we spent the whole hour on, on that, I want to say uh, everybody keep fighting and there are, you know, the fact that a... Uh, a progressive like Bernie Sanders could even get this close, even if this thing is stolen from him. The fact that uh, we have def- b- 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 largely defeated, and I realize that if he loses, it's not going to feel like defeating them, but largely defeated the mainstream media, forced them to uh, to be outed as someone, as a group that is rigging towards corporate candidates, our system, forced the DNC to again be outed. I mean, now granted, as you always say, it depends on what you do next, and I totally agree, but I think along the way, you have to celebrate these wins. And the fact that Bernie Sanders is even competitive right now is a testament to the fact that we have uh, taken the mainstream media and said your corporate talking points are not OK anymore. Right. We've, uh, you know, millions of people have seen past the bullshit uh, and done and done their own research and voted based on their own interests. So that's huge. But I also just want to give a plug to this because uh, a few friends and I have started organizing this site called burn the DNC dot org, B-E-R-N the DNC dot org. And it really focuses on this. A nonviolent organization. Uh, it focuses on this moment as using this moment in time, our place in time, to organize around this most overt affront to self-determination. Uh, and so even if you're not a, a Bernie voter, um, we want you to be a part of this uh, because obviously there are legitimate concerns with Bernie, but this is this is for Bernie supporters. This is for people that just think this system is fucked. Like we want all of you, just like the French uh, organized in the streets 
regarding pension reform, but there were, you know, kids out there. There was there were anarchists. There were centrists. Well, there, were, there, there, were, were, there were libertarians and leftists. Well, yeah. right. That, and that's my point. It's you're using this moment as a jumping off point, as a collectivizing uh, intersection to meet at. So we're inviting folks uh, from all over that spectrum to come and join us and to uh, to basically pledge to uh, to in, get involved with direct action or organizing or some way uh, to 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 you again to use this moment to come together in solidarity to uh, hold people accountable and to uh, shut shit down if and when it needs to happen. So that's uh, b e r n burn the dnc dot org, a nonviolent organization. Uh, so <laughs> Lee's my legal team. <laughs> I'm the legal team. Um, B E R N, folks. Uh, I already said that. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just gonna run. But uh, so I just want to spend the last few minutes uh, uh, some uh, talking a little bit about coronavirus. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it on Redacted tonight a little as well, so I won't overdo it. But you all know all the basics and everything, so we're not gonna like get into the details of the news about it, except that a couple things. One is that when they say, "Oh, there's only been a few cases here and there in the U.S." they're not testing anyone. It's like, <laughs> so very few people in America, you know, but CDC was saying they had only tested 500, but it's definitely in the thousands now. They claim that states are doing some of their own testing. Whatever it is, it's not a lot of people. So the idea that we know how many people in America have coronavirus is like a laughable thing. But before you run around and decide you're, you know, need to uh, lock yourself in your house and stab anyone who gets close, um, it also is, you know, the estimates now are that like 40 to 70 percent of the human population on Earth will eventually get coronavirus. But the vast, vast majority will a either never even know it, b get some sort of like small like cough or something and not realize it's coronavirus or c have something that feels like the flu, but be OK. So it's not that, you know. It's not like it's, Ebola. It's not, it's, it's not like Ebola. It's not good. To get you. you shouldn't run around and go share a lollipop with someone with coronavirus. But also, I think we need to take things into account and not freak the fuck out. Um, and also, you should keep coming to my live shows. But yes, do that. <laughs> but I think this is also a great moment to talk about. Uh, and I know we're going to wrap up soon, but I just wanted to point out real quick that it's mainly the old and babies. And, you know, who cares <laughs> that, um, that this is about. really indicative of the, the, the pitfalls and failures of our for profit healthcare system. Right, that's what I wanted to get to. Yeah. And uh, and I shared a tweet by a woman who uh, says that she has the symptoms of coronavirus. She lives in in Washington, in Seattle, and uh, she shared a thread of of tweets about the fiasco that she went through just to try and get tested. Which, by the way, she, she still hasn't been tested. She has a lot of the symptoms, and so she wanted to find out for herself and for others whether she had it. So. And it's I'm not going to read the whole thread because it's quite long, but I do recommend that people go check it out. You could find it. I retweeted it at activist Eleanor. Uh, And this is... It, it, it's so indicative of how fucked up our healthcare system is that somebody actually like goes out of their way. She, you know, she called multiple places, multiple doctors and said like, Hey, look, I think I might have this. And everyone just gave her this fucking like corporate call center run around. Well, she started like with the like CDC hotline and they put her on hold for like 40 minutes. And then, and then she just hung up like it. <laughs> right. So, and if you can, if you consider the fact that a lot of people that, uh, that would be calling to, you know, for, for this kind of information or people that don't have time to wait on hold for 40 minutes. I mean, and not only that, but, uh, you know, this also extends to the conversation about sick leave in this country. People can't take sick leave because they don't right. have sick leave. They'll right. get fired. They can't take the cut and pay. So you have people that really are sick, but they can't fuck it, which is also why you see things like the flu epidemic in this country is always, always kills more people than other industrialized nations. Why? Because people fucking can't take time off of work and then they're coughing into the French fries that they then go to serve you <laughs> well if it's at mcdonald's uh whatever that's cooked in will kill any <laughs> virus so it's fine there's the amount of salt the virus would hit that amount of salt and be like oh dear god uh, uh and the but... other uh, another intersection here because you know i if you listen to to my work you know that i always like to talk about intersections here uh this also speaks to things like water rights so for instance a lot of folks no it doesn't <laughs> a lot of folks Stop it. in uh 
in in around Flint and Detroit, Michigan. You might remember if you've if you watched my show, then you'll recall that I've talked about this issue. They're just shutting off water to people who have failed to pay the exorbitant fees in places like Flint and Detroit, where <laughs> how, how sad is that? They're shutting off their lead water. Right. We're not going to give you your poison water anymore, so you'll just have no water. So there are thousands, there are currently thousands of families across Michigan and, of course, outside of Michigan, too. But this is uh, kind of the epicenter of the water shutoff crisis that don't have running water. And you're asking people to, you know, wash your hands, make sure that you right. that you stay right. clear. And it's like, well, maybe running water would help in the fucking richest country and in the then, world. And then there's the fact that people can't afford to get tested for coronavirus. A, a story went viral of one man who insisted on being tested for it because uh, he thought he had it. And it ultimately he got a bill for thirty five hundred dollars. Right. So if you want an America to not get caught in a pandemic you need to actually give them a way to be tested easily and for free and uh, th- this, <laughs> this was a story that that popped up a, a few days ago as well the health and human services chief uh refused to promise that the uh that the uh, that any coronavirus uh, coronavirus vaccine would be affordable for all not just the rich so they're basically even saying, though initially they even though initially they had said that won't be true he goes he, he goes oh i don't know how much it'll cost right so you're basically saying not only do we not care how much it costs to get tested for you poor folks but you can go ahead and die and that's totally cool uh, economist Richard Wolf uh, went over what's going on with the ma- face masks because people are all freaking out, saying they they they're ordering face masks online, and there's a now a shortage, which means the companies are like, wow, this is a chance to make a lot of money. So they're and by the way, folks, don't everyone should not order face masks. You should leave them for medical personnel. But uh, so they're like gouging. They've doubled the price, tripled the price of these of these you know standard face masks, and uh, you know, Richard Wolff's point is this is how uh, capitalism works. Mm-hmm. You have uh, it doesn't matter whether it would help more people to give them affordable face masks. Uh, what matters is that you make a lot of money in the chance you get because, uh, you know, who cares whether those people die or not? Who cares whether a pandemic happens? In fact, a pandemic is better for your business in the face mask. Yeah. So that's what the market economy says. And uh and he said p- people who argue with him and go, well, that you know, the, 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 the market economy is just responding to uh, supply and demand. And Richard Wolff's point is, yeah, but guess what? These companies are not stupid. They also understand supply and demand. So they're not going to run out and make a ton, uh, you know, millions so that they can lower the price again. They're just going to make the standard amount, enjoy the fact that there's a, uh, not enough of them, and, uh, and sell them for a crazy price because it's great for money because they, they understand how supply and demand works and they want the demand. They want people, you know, fucking beating each other over the head and paying $1,000 for a face mask. So you end up in a system, this is how capitalism works, where the the wealthy or, or the ri- sometimes the very rich, sometimes people that just have a few thousand dollars in the bank can afford to get face masks and uh, be safer from disease than those who don't have a lot of money. Also, with regards to the Which face masks, fucked up. also with regards to the face masks, I've talked to a couple of uh, medical professionals and they've said that unless you already have, unless you're sick already and you want to keep others from getting sick, the face mask doesn't really make much sense. The best thing to do is like the good old fashioned shit. And I know it sucks to hear it, but it's just the same shit that's always worked. Don't touch your face with your dirty, grubby hands and wash your fucking hands. Purell is a racket. Uh, What really works is the actual act of washing the bacteria uh, off of your hands. So do that shit. Hold on. I bought a box of face masks that I've been using to wipe my ass. Is that... Helpful. And then you put it on your face? No, I don't or, put it on my face. Oh. I, I just feel it's cleaner on the ass. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, where where do we stand on that? I don't know that it's I. It's very have. expensive, though. I agree. I uh, you you. I mean, you might as well just wipe your ass with a hundred dollar bills. And um, on that image, <laughs> I think we'll wrap up. But if you think this show was important, and I hope you do, we did we did math for you on this show. For fuck's sake, do you understand how much I hate math? I did that for you, folks. Uh, please go over and become a member at patreon.com slash common censored 
Every week we give an extra 10 or 15 minutes over there on patreon.com slash common censored. So if you feel this show was worth a couple of bucks, that would be awesome for you to join uh, the members over there. And uh, I'm coming to New York City this weekend for the big book release of Bullet Points and Punchlines, my new book Wee. with a foreword by Chris Hedges and an intro by Jimmy Dore. And the book is at LeeCampBook.com. All of my scheduled appearances, including Tucson and Flagstaff, where Eleanor will be opening the shows, that is at RedactedTour.com. Or you can get it all at LeeCamp.com. You'll just navigate to the schedule or whatever. Um, Asheville, North Carolina, a bunch of other places, Toronto. It's all on the schedule. Oh, yeah, we're adding London and uh, Dublin and Liverpool very yeah. soon. If those tickets aren't up yet, they will be soon. That's all at LeeCamp.com. And Eleanor is coming to Denver, and all of her work is at Activist Eleanor. No, no, it's at uh, ArtKillingApathy.com, and you're at Activist Eleanor on Twitter. Indeed I am, and uh, thank you so much for today. I'm going to go have a drink. Until next time. <laughs> yeah, early in the morning. <laughs> time to get time to get started. Act out. Keep fighting.